Now I want to look at um, two really important letters that Plato wrote. One is the seventh letter. These are, they're referred to as Plato's epistles, the letters that Plato wrote to various people. Right. One is the seventh letter and one is the second letter. And significantly, the second letter, Plato's second letter is a letter that he wrote to Dionysus II of Syracuse. Oh my God, this is gonna, this is gonna lead up to another good question, go ahead. Where, okay. Doesn't he try to kill Plato later? Plutarch uh, writes a story. It's one of the tyrants of Sicily or Syracuse tries to kill Plato. And then Plato had to get out of there by the school. Yes, I thought you said cure. No, yes, kill. No, no, no. Yeah. It's a disaster. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. so, okay, so Plato, and this is also a really important point to grasp in terms of the philosopher living his ideas. A philosopher as someone who doesn't just sit in an ivory tower but wants to change the world, okay? wants his ideas to reshape society. Plato attempted to implement his conception of the ideal society. He went to Syracuse in contemporary Italy, uh, Southern Italy, and he attempted through a follower of his in the court of Dionysus the Elder, Dionysus I, a guy named Dion, who was part of the family of Dionysus, was a follower of Plato. And this Dion gave him basically, Plato, a foothold in the royal court of Syracuse. And Plato tried to influence the son of Dionysus to not be a tyrant like his father and basically mold him into the type of philosopher king that he portrays in Republic. And long story short, Dionysus gets rubbed the wrong way by this, and his courtiers convince him that Plato's out to wreck the conservative traditional society of Syracuse. And he has Plato sold into slavery. Yeah. And Plato and some rich guy bails Plato out basically and buys his freedom, and Plato escapes back to Athens. Then Dionysus dies, Dionysus the first dies. And Dionysus come, the second comes to power, and Dion, uh, who's his uncle, Dion is the uncle of Dionysus the second. He winds right. up with more influence at court, and so he basically implores Plato to come back and try again. And Plato comes back and he tries again now to shape uh, Dionysus the second, a monarch who's actually on the throne. And the second letter is a letter to this Dionysus the second of Syracuse which Plato writes to him after Plato is forced to flee again. Plato is forced, you know, yeah, at the risk Plut of his life, to flee Plut for a second time. Yeah, Plutarch says that this, I think it was the second dynasty who wanted to kill Plato and almost did, was very yes. close to doing it. Yes, and then, get this, he repents at some years later, Dionysus II has a change of heart and he convinces yeah. Dion to beg Plato to come back for a third time to Syracuse. And, and he agrees he's going to let Plato basically experiment in Syracuse with his ideas for social engineering and so forth. Um, and it ends badly for a third time. And the third time, as Dionysus II basically, uh, you know, conspires to uh, execute both Plato and Dion, Dion leads a coup d'etat against the government of his nephew and tries to take power directly, basically as a representative of Plato's philosophical project. And Dion is killed in the process and Plato has to escape Syracuse, you know, uh, for the third time, right? So he, he, he basically, is, no, and, and this, this is, is very same, important. This is the same geographical location where Parmenides and Pythagoras and all these guys yeah. are. Yes. So this is this is a yeah. huge thing for West for the Western for the Western civilization. Like all these events are shaping the world today in yes. a weird way, in the ripple effect way. Yeah. But no, this is really important in in terms of understanding the concept of the noble lie. Okay, um, this is an idea that that Plato uh, brings up in. I'm going to come back to the letters. I know we're going on a tangent, but it, it's still relevant to setting this up. What Pl Plato's misadventure in Syracuse 
is very important to understanding the noble lie as an applicable concept. In 4, uh, 14 to 415 in Republic, Plato introduces this idea of an, a lie that would be noble, a deception that would be, uh, you know, that would be of merit and would have, you know, that would be virtuous, a virtuous deception. Okay. He introduces this idea at 414 to 415 in the context of the so-called myth of metals, where he's saying that, you know, we have this tripartite society with the guardians or the philosopher rulers at the top, the military class uh, of, of basically, you know, noble-minded knights in the middle, and then the general citizenry of farmers and business people in the third tier. And he's saying that as part of getting people to accept this type of structure uh, in society, which is of course a meritocratic structure because people are educated, they all receive the same general education and it's throughout the course of their education that it's determined which class of society they belong in. But as part of getting people to accept this kind of meritocratic tripartite class division of society will inculcate them from childhood with the myth that the gods have mixed one or another metal into their soul. And the philosopher rulers have gold mixed into their soul. The uh, noble warrior caste has silver mixed into its soul. And the uh, general populace of farmers and merchants bronze. have bronze. And so that's the context in which he introduced. So in other words, this is bullshit, okay? It's a lie, it's a, some myth, but children, should be brought up with this myth because it's constructive to reinforcing what is actually a noble attempt to replace the uh, arbitrary aristocracy and kind of quasi-feudal society of the time with a meritocratic system, right? So it's, it's serving to actually reward individuals for their merit as expressed through their uh, performance in the course of their education. So that, that's what makes it a noble lie. And then this noble lie comes up two more times. Once in the context of how uh, marriages will be set up with a view to eugenic breeding. How Okay, so in the Republic, the philosopher rulers and the military class are all married to each other. They, they have a kind of like common marriage. It's like a basically free love. Okay, people in the men and women in the ruling class and the men and women who serve as soldiers basically have a communal life where they're all sleeping with one another. The general populace though, ha ha, you know, have marriages and, and have families, but the marriages are arranged with a view to eugenic breeding. In other words, the people with the best genes should be the ones who get together in order to produce children free from diseases and deformities and so forth and the brightest children and so forth. Plato is the father of the concept of eugenics. But he says, to make this go down easier, we'll tell the general populace that like, you know, we're gonna hold certain lotteries that determine who they get to marry. What, what group of people are their eligible mates? And this is the second application of the noble lie in service of the eugenic breeding program. The third and final example of the noble lie uh, is the most important though and the most relevant to our general conversation. And that's where Plato says, again, going back to his attack on Homer and how all the sadism and brutality in the Iliad, for example, is deleterious to the development of the youth. Plato says that, look, these religious myths that we have are ancient and we don't know whether what they're depicting is something that ever really took place. We have little knowledge of vast antiquity. And so we should spin these myths. We should rewrite them in ways that are more constructive to the development of the youth and frame a religion that portrays gods and goddesses and so forth in a way that will serve as a, an ethical example for the children brought up with this religion. And the guardians, the philosopher rulers don't have to believe in this religion. It's not true, but it's constructive for developing a society oriented toward actual discovery of the truth. In other words, a society where science can flourish. 
Yeah. And okay, so now you got to understand, we're dealing now with an incredibly duplicitous person. This person is proposing restructuring the entire religion of the society based on lies and creating a false religion, which the rulers themselves won't believe in, but which they'll get the majority of the population to believe in, because that type of religion, that, that, I don't want to call it a cult, uh, will actually foster scientific thinking in the long run and will be more conducive to the development of reflective, critical, and strong individuals which seems a little paradoxical, right? But it's the idea that you have to force people to be free. And on the way to doing that, on the way to forcing people to think for themselves, you need to give them certain constructive fables, myths, right? Ideas that may be false, but that will be thought provoking and that will uh, be, um, that will cultivate virtue in them. OK, so so these are the different, you know, uh, uh, examples of the use of the noble lie. And as I said at the beginning, what I'm suggesting is that this entire theory of forms is itself a noble lie. So to get back to that argument, right, we were talking about, you know, the, the sun, which if you stare straight at, and by the way, the metaphor of a sun that never sets is at the heart of the writings of Heraclitus. So I think that Plato is getting the simile of the sun straight from out of his years as a Heraclitean in his youth. And in the context of this whole discussion of how until and unless you're ready for it, contemplating the good, the form of the good can blind you intellectually. It can drive you mad spiritually, right? And so you need something like the forms as a sort of safety net on the way to that. In the context of all of that, let me uh, read what Plato uh, says in, in some key passages of these two letters, this the seventh letter and the second letter, the one to Dionysus of Syracuse. In the seventh letter, Plato writes, this much at any rate I can affirm about any present or future writers who pretend to knowledge of the matters with which I concern myself, whether they claim to have been taught by me or by a third party or to have discovered the truth for themselves. In my judgment, it is impossible that they should have any understanding of the subject. No treatise by me concerning it exists or ever will exist. If I thought that any adequate spoken or written account could be given to the world at large, what more glorious life work could I have undertaken than to put into writing what would be of great benefit to mankind and to bring the nature of reality to light for all to see? But I do not think that the attempt to put these matters into words would be to men's advantage, except to those few who can find out the truth for themselves with a little guidance. That is why any student of serious realities will shrink from making truth the helpless object of men's ill will by committing it to writing. In a word, the conclusion to be drawn is this. When one sees a written composition, whether it be on law by a legislator or on any other subject, one can be sure if the writer, if the writer is a serious man, that his book does not represent his most serious thoughts. They remain stored up in the noblest region of his personality, unquote. And now one short passage from the second letter, his letter to Dionysus II of Syracuse, quote, Take precautions, lest this teaching ever be disclosed among untrained people. It is impossible for what is written not to be disclosed. That is the reason why I have never written anything about these things and why there is not and will not be any written work of Plato's own. Farewell and believe. Read this letter now at once many times and burn it. Wow. Unquote. So Plato never wrote his philosophy. All these writings we have, the, the most voluminous intellectual work that survived the destruction of the Library of Alexandria and so forth, the corpus of Plato does not represent the teaching of Plato. What Plato wrote were plays. He was a tragedian. He was a trained playwright. Remember, he burned his plays 
when he met Socrates. He torched them and dedicated the burning of his plays to Prometheus and called for the god of fire to inspire him in his next endeavor, which is his philosophical project. But he did that at the theater of Dionysus. And as someone who's coming from out of the Dionysian tragic poetic tradition, uh, a tradition of ecstasy, of mystical frenzy, right? Of uh, the contemplation of beauty as the key to understanding the nature of the divine. And so I think that Plato's unwritten doctrine, which he, he tells us exists, right? In the se seventh letter and in the second letter, he says his true teaching remains unwritten. So meaning what? Meaning we have to read between the lines of the dialogues if we have to, want to understand you know, what Plato actually thought. And we have to read between the lines to understand what the hell Plato was trying to do in Syracuse or why Plato thought that noble lies needed to be employed for the sake of reshaping society beneficently. Okay, so this is what I argue in the Pharmacon Artist that Plato, and of course the name of that essay is a play on words, right? Pharmacon, it's the snake poison. That's also a medicine in the right dose which is what yeah. Socrates is accused of dispensing. He's being accused of being a pharmacuse. But obviously my title, The Pharmacon Artist, has con artist in it. Oh, right? nice, nice. So okay. He's a, and in a way, I mean, Alcibiades accuses Socrates of being a con man in symposium. Why would Plato write that? He builds up this character, this great tragic martyr, seeker of truth, enlightened, and he, he allows Alcibiades, he gives him the stage with the main ads playing the Dionysian flute tunes in Symposium to portray Socrates as a kind of trickster, con man, you know, basically uh, magician, witch doctor, right? Because Plato's telling us something about himself and who and what he really is, what he's up to.